Welcome to the Childbirth and Neonatal Resuscitation Skills Assessment. You should address me as you would the patient and I will respond based upon your questions. You will perform all the skills necessary on the training aid as appropriate and you may use any of the material here at the station. As the scenario progresses, I will provide important information that you need to move on to the next step in the scenario and may ask you to clarify or explain the action you are taking. You must perform certain time critical steps in the allotted time and critical sequential steps in the correct order and may not readjust them later. When not addressing the patient, you should verbally explain the actions you are taking as you demonstrate them. You must perform all the interventions and assessments correctly. You will have a trained EMT assistant with you who can perform all interventions on the mother that you direct. You have 15 minutes to complete the station. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the equipment and training aids. Do you have any questions? No. You respond to a 29-year-old woman's house who called 911 because she thinks she is in labor and will not make it to the hospital. When you arrive, the front door is unlocked and you enter to find the woman lying on her living room floor. She appears in obvious discomfort and is audibly groaning and stating, I think my baby is coming. All right, so my first step is always going to be making sure that my scene is safe, taking my BSI precautions and putting on the appropriate PPE. The next thing I'm going to do is approach my patient addresser. So, hi, my name is Abby. I'll be the EMT helping you out today. What is your name? Melissa. Melissa, what is your expected due date and how many children are you expecting? My baby is due to be born tomorrow and just the one. Okay, and what um, is the frequency of your contractions? They are coming about every two minutes. Okay, and how long are these contractions lasting for? They last about 30 to 60 seconds. Okay, and did you happen to notice if your water broke? Yes. Uh, about how long ago did it break? It broke about an hour and a half ago. Okay, and when the water broke, did you notice any color or any smell? The fluid was clear, and I didn't notice any smell. Okay, perfect. Um, have you ever been pregnant before? This is currently my third pregnancy. Okay, and how many live births have you had? What were the outcomes of those pregnancies? I have two children, a five-year-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old. Okay, and in those previous pregnancies, how did they deliver? Both of them were vaginal deliveries. Okay, and did you have any complications with those pregnancies? No. And are you expecting any complications during this current pregnancy? No, I do not. Okay, and do you have an OB that you've been visiting for this pregnancy? Yes, I have an OB I visit regularly, and she's the one who delivered my previous children, too. Perfect. Do you have any pre-existing medical conditions or any medical conditions that you developed during this pregnancy? No, I do not. Okay, and have you been taking any medications prior to pregnancy? I'm taking my prenatal vitamins. Perfect. Have you noticed any vaginal bleeding? No. And do you have any abdominal pain outside of the contractions you're experiencing? No, just the contraction pain. Okay, so now that we have finished our history taking questions, I'm going to direct my EMT assistant to obtain mom's vital signs. I would like to get mom's blood pressure, her pulse rate, her respiratory rate, and I would also like her temperature. Now we're going to check for signs of imminent delivery. So my first sign or evidence of imminent delivery is the contractions that are lasting for 30 to 60 seconds, and they're coming about every two minutes. Another sign of imminent delivery would be checking for the presence of crowning. So observing the vaginal opening, crowning is going to be where we can see the top of the baby's head. So that is another sign of imminent delivery. Another way to know that delivery is imminent is asking the mom if she feels the urge to push or to defecate, make a bowel movement. So Melissa, do you have the urge to push? Yes. Okay, so now that we have gone through all of our history taking and signs of imminent delivery, I believe that the baby is coming. We are going to be delivering now. So I will begin to prepare my OB kit in the delivery area. So opening up our OB kit. The first thing I want to start with is what we call our chuck. This is the pad that we're going to place underneath the mom's hips. So asking the mom to lift up her waist, we are going to slide that pad underneath. I want to make sure that I have my blanket ready for the baby once they are all dried off with the towels that we have in the OB kit. So we want to make sure that we're always drying the baby with the towels and we will wrap them in the blanket once they are dry. We also have this beanie to put over the baby's head once they are wrapped up in that blanket. Additionally, we have some pads in here to help control any postpartum hemorrhaging for mom. You have two options. One is a standard gauze and the other is going to be a peri pad. Then we want to isolate some other important equipment. We have our clamps that we're going to place on the cord. We have our umbilical scissors that we're going to use to cut the umbilical cord. It's important to note that these will be sterile in packaging. We also have a bulb syringe that we will utilize if we have to suction out the baby's mouth and their nostrils. 
Lastly, we have some additional PPE that we want to talk about putting on. This is going to be an example of our sterile gloves. Some other additional PPE will consist of things like a face, ma face mask, a face shield. You might even have a cap, a gown, and boot coverings as well. So now that we have our delivery area prepared, we are ready to assist in the delivery of the baby. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and get my hands in position. My bottom hand is gonna be applying gentle pressure on the mother's perineum to help get the facial structures of the baby out. My top hand is gonna be always covering and supporting the baby's head. Now, Melissa, on your next contraction, I'm gonna need you to start pushing. Okay, I'm having a contraction. Okay, go ahead and push, making sure to support the baby's head the entire time. As soon as the baby's head and their neck are out, there's three critical things I want to assess for. The first is going to be if the amniotic sac has ruptured. Because of my history taking questions, I know that her water already had previously broken. However, if her amniotic sac had not ruptured yet, this is now the point in time where I'd need to do that. If the amniotic sac hadn't ruptured, what I would need to do is make sure to always support the baby's head, but use my free hand to puncture, pinch, and twist the amniotic sac away from the baby's face. Then I'm gonna need to be prepared to start sucking and clearing their airway. The next thing I need to check for is meconium staining. Meconium is the baby's first bowel movement. And what it might look like is brownish staining on the baby's head or the face. It's another indication that we'll need to suction the airway immediately. The third thing I need to check for is a nuchal cord. The nuchal cord is the umbilical cord wrapped around the baby's neck. If the nuchal cord is present, the first thing I need to do is tell the mom to stop pushing. Then I'm going to need to take my free hand and I'm going to use two fingers to unloop the umbilical cord over the baby's head. So I would take the two fingers underneath the cord and pull it over the baby's head. If that did not work, I couldn't get my fingers in there to unloop it, I would have to take my clamps and I would place them about two inches apart over the baby's shoulders and then I would have to use the sterile scissors to cut the cord in the center of the clamps when it stops pulsating. None of these things are present. Normal delivery will continue. Okay, so now we're gonna continue to support the baby as the rest of the baby comes out. So making sure to always keep a hand on their head at all times and then waiting for those shoulders to deliver the widest portion of the baby. My next hand is gonna start sliding down the trunk of the baby to support the remainder of the body as the baby itself delivers. From here, I need to make sure to direct my partner to note the time of birth, control any postpartum hemorrhaging for the mom, and then reassess mom's vitals. Now I'm gonna keep the baby nice and low at the level of the perineum, also known as the level of the uterus, and we will hold the baby here as we continue our assessment until the cord has stopped pulsating. So now for training purposes, I'm just going to go ahead and gently lay the baby down. That way I have both of my hands to continue on this assessment. Um, there are some time critical steps that not, need to happen within 30 seconds, within 30 to 60 seconds, and after a minute of postpartum. The first one is going to be assessing the airway and the need to suction if it's indicated. The baby's airway is open and clear, but if it wasn't, can you demonstrate how to suction them for me? Sure, so if we were to be suctioning, we would need to be using our bulb syringe. It's important to note that before we suction with a bulb syringe, we have to depress the plunger before we insert it into their airway. We always begin by suctioning out the mouth first, eliminating whatever, eliminating whatever is inside, depressing it again, that way we can suction out both of their nostrils. And we will suction the mouth and nose until their airway is clear. Now that their airway is clear, we want to begin drying them off. So whenever we dry off the newborn, we are going to be utilizing the towels. Now, how I'm picking up the baby is just for training purposes, um, but just to demonstrate that we need to dry off all of the baby and also begin to stimulate them as we go through this process. As you can see that after I use a towel to dry them off, I'm putting that wet towel off to the side, making an important note that we are discarding it and we are never going to be using it again. Now that the baby is dry, we're gonna go ahead and now wrap them in their newborn blanket. So we're gonna get our blanket out here and we are gonna start wrapping them up to keep them warm. Additionally, I can go ahead and put the beanie on them to make sure they retain a lot of warmth coming from their head. Okay, great. Before you move on to fully swaddle the baby, mm -hmm. could you please use both of your hands and demonstrate where you would be placing the clamps on the umbilical cord? 
Sure, so using these clamps, I would be placing them on the umbilical cord. The first one is gonna have to go about 10 inches away from the baby, so we would estimate about 10 inches away, and then we would need to backtrack three inches for seven inches away from the baby. This is where we're gonna place our two clamps. Then, once the cord has stopped pulsating, and we would always make sure that the cord was stopped pulsating before we put our clamps on, we would use the sterile umbilical scissors, and we're gonna make the cut in the middle. Okay, great. You can go ahead and pull the umbilical cord out of the baby mannequin now for training purposes and put it off to the side. Okay. At this point, where could you move the infant to? So now that we are fully swaddling up the infant, as long as the mom and the baby are both stable, we are going to bring the infant up to the mom's chest so we can retain warmth to this infant. Great. Now, at what points will you be determining an APGAR score for the baby? So I'll need to get an APGAR score at the one minute mark and again at the five minute mark. Now I just have some hypothetical postpartum questions for you. Okay. If the baby has a heart rate of less than 100 or they are gasping or apneic, what would you do for them? So if the baby has a heart rate of less than 100 or they're gasping or apneic, what we would need to do is begin positive pressure ventilation using a BVM on room air, and we would need to give our respirations anywhere from 40 to 60 a minute. Okay. And if the baby's heart rate is still less than 100 after 30 seconds of positive pressure ventilation, what would you do then? I would then need to add some oxygen to the positive pressure, pressure ventilation I'm giving to the infant. And if the baby's heart rate ever dropped to less than 60, what would you do? If their heart rate ever dropped to less than 60, then I would need to begin CPR at a three compression to one breath ratio. Okay, great. Can you now describe the APGAR chart for me, what it stands for, and what zero, one, and two are for each category? Sure, so APGAR stands for appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respirations. For appearance, a zero would be central cyanosis or cyanosis all over the body. For a one, it would be peripheral cyanosis, which means cyanosis in the extremities, and a two would be a pink baby. For a pulse, a zero would be absent, a one would be a pulse of less than 100, and a two would be a pulse greater than 100. For grimace, zero would be no grimace or absent, a one would be a grimace, that baby scrunch face that they make, and a two would be if the baby is able to cough and sneeze. For our activity, a zero would be absent or no activity, a one would be little activity or weak flexion, and then a two would be full activity or full flexion. For respirations, zero would be absent or no respirations, a one would be a weak cry, and then a two would be a good strong cry. Is there anything at this point you would like to add? No. Okay, end skill.